Today's experimental math seminar speaker is Victor S. Miller from CCR IDA, who will talk about locally preserving hash functions, a partial order, and tiles in binary space. As usual, if you have a question, unmute yourself and, and ask a question, but otherwise, please mute yourself. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Doron. Thank you for inviting me and, and breaking your unofficial rule of having uh, having a person speak more than once in a, a semester. Uh, can everybody see my uh, my screen that I'm sharing? Okay, good. Uh, so as Daron said, this is uh, essentially uh, an interesting story and partial journey. Uh, and so here's the, here's the story. Uh, here's a problem, uh, what I call finding two needles in a haystack. Uh, so here's the problem. You're given some list a long, long list of n-bit strings. Think of n as, say, 64 bits, little, little n. And think of capital N as being like a billion or more. Um, and so some uh, adversary, who, no who knows, has planted a pair among these random strings, uh, which are unusually close in Hamming distance. That is the number of places where they, they disagree. And everything else is random. And so your problem, this sounds like Mission Impossible, your, your problem, in, in case you wish to choose it, is to find the planted pair. So how would one do this? Uh, well, uh, th that's the problem. So interestingly enough, this problem sort of generated a whole bunch of things. And I said, you know, have we gone down a rabbit hole? Uh, so in, in process of exploring this problem, uh, we encounter the isoparametric inequality for the Hamming cube, which I'll explain later, uh, syndrome decoding of, of linear codes, uh, an, in, an interesting partial order, uh, discrete tiles in binary space, uh, the fast Hadamard transform, linear programming, and bin packing. Uh, so, of course, these all didn't come up at once, but they all came up in an essential way. Uh, so, Here's the first obvious attempt. Uh, since the, the bit strings are random, um, if you take any of the, any two of them are the, that are random, that the expected number, expected distance between any two of them is about little n over two. So any hit, in other words, if you find two very, very close, much smaller than n over two, it's not spurious. Uh, so, uh, well, the obvious first thing to do is exhaustion, which is mean try all pairs. Uh, so the work is capital N times N minus one over two or N choose two. And even for N is 10 to the ninth, that's a fair amount of work. Uh, I mean, you could really do it if you really wanted, but if N were like 10 to the 12th, it would really start getting uncomfortable. Uh, so then there's a question of how much is finding this pair worth to you, but that's, that's another matter. Uh, so the question is, can we really do any better than this? Uh, and so here's the idea, and this is where the problem started for me. Uh, you can use a hash function. Uh, so a hash function is just something that sort of takes something in a, in a fairly large number of bits and compresses it down to a smaller number of bits. And it sort of should act randomly. Uh, that's, that's the idea. But basically, we're going to put an extra condition on this hash function, if we're lucky. Uh, so, but the, all, the whole idea is, if someone hands you a function like this, what you could do is you could take each string and you distribute the strings into buckets. And the buckets are labeled with the value of the hash function at your string. Uh, so, and then the strategy is you only compare bit strings in the same bucket. Now, well, first of all, this cuts down the number of comparisons you have by two to the n minus r. Remember, r is the number of bits you're hashing down to. Uh, but, you know, there's no free lunch. So, um, you don't have certainty. So, suppose that the sought for pair is w and w tilde. Uh, so this will work well if somehow you're, you can contrive to make this hash function have a good property that the, um, uh, just a second, 
I have to do not disturb here. Uh, okay. Uh, so it'll work well if the probability of W and W tilde being in the same bucket is large enough. In other words, larger than what you'd expect at random. Doesn't that so, mean that it's a lousy house function? Well, um, it's well, it depends what you're using the hash function for. Um, so, I mean, whether or not you want, I mean, it turns out in the literature, these are called hash functions. These are called locality preserving hash functions, because locality in the case of Hamming distance. Uh, okay. If things are I'd, close. I'd call that a lousy hash function. Well, okay. Well, but as I said, I, 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 th this is the standard terminology in, in the field. <laughs> so, but of course, there's no free lunch, so this loses certainty. But what one can do is one can uh, say, figure out what's the probability, what's the expected number of, of you know, so, so, so you do this sort of thing and you can say, well, you have a certain probability of succeeding this way. And if we fail, then we try another hash function at random. So the whole idea is you pick a whole bunch of random hash functions like this. And if they're fairly independent, you can, see what the expected time is till you're going to find the thing. And if you play your cards right, you're, you've, you've actually cut down the expected time by some decent amount. So here's a question. What are the best FUs? You know, can, can I you ask a quick question? Sure, sure. Are you going to allow looking at two to the R possible hash functions or not? Um, no, not necessarily. Uh, we're just going to, uh, well, I mean that, you know, if, if R is big, two to the R possible hash functions is two to the two to the R function. So this is not, uh, not something that's very feasible, even for R pretty small. Uh, so in Thank fact, you. part, part of, yeah, you're welcome. Part of what's going to go on is we actually characterize what certain you know, equivalences among hash functions are able to cut down the search by a huge amount. So that, that's, a, that's a big part of what's going on here. Um, so in order to set the stage, I have to recall something which some of you know about, but some of you don't. It's uh, what I call channels and codes. So there's a standard thing in coding theory. Uh, one of the first things you look is something called the binary symmetric channel. And basically all that is, is if you're transmitting bits across a wire, you have a certain probability P that your adversary across the wire is going to flip that bit from a zero to one or one to zero. You know, and the whole idea of the binary symmetric channel is every bit that you send is independently done that way. Uh, so, uh, so just to set notation, when I pass a bit string through the binary symmetric channel uh, parameterized by P, I'll say that the result is X tilde. Uh, and, and a code is just some subset of bit strings. Now, um, it's error detecting if, if I, you take a code word, that's, that's some member of the code, and when you look at the garbled, that's, that's what, what I'll call X tilde thing, and it's not in the code, we've detected an error. Uh, and it's error correcting if when you start with a code word and you look at X tilde, and if X tilde is not an S, you by some means you try to find the X hat, which is closest, uh, the, the, that, that code word, which is closest to that. And you basically, in error correcting, you declare that to be the original thing. And of course, you know, again, you have a certain probability uh, that you're going to fail, but but you hope that you make the probability low. Uh, so one of the things that you can do is for this matter, for any code S, for any set of bit strings, you can compute that uh, the probability that if you start with a code word, that the garble code word is still an S. So that's really essential to the analysis of error detecting codes, because that's really the probability of failure because uh, if, if it looks like a code word, you've decided that everything's okay. But uh, if, if this happens, then, uh, then it's not okay. Uh, so you can actually compute this. So 
there are two uh, related things. So I'll see, you know, regular f sub s, uh, because it all depends on, on the code s of, of a function t is just this following sum of a sub i of s to t to the i, just like a polynomial where a sub i of s is just the number of pairs of code words which are of distance exactly i. And in fact, it's a fairly uh, simple exercise to show that I'll call uh, script f sub s uh, is just, which is the actual probability that we're interested in, is just a uh, is just essentially this thing plugged in by p divided by one minus p uh, times a certain fixed factor. Uh, and so, in your if your business is in error detecting codes when you, you want to choose a set S so that this probability of failure is as small as possible. So you want to minimize this script F of S. Uh, but it turns out in our case that if you look, if you take this putative hash function that we want to investigate and you look at, you fix a bucket and you, you know, F inverse of B, is the bucket is the set of elements that land in that bucket. And so if you, uh, if you take this function script F of S and, you, and the S you take now is just the elements in the bucket, that gives you essentially a probability um, that you're going to sum up over all buckets. And it turned out that that probability is the probability that you wanna maximize. Because in our case, you want things to that are close up together to be uh, in the same bucket with a fairly with a high enough probability. So it turns out we have essentially the same function that's investigated in error detecting codes, but instead of minimizing it, we want to maximize it. So in fact, we want to find like the worst possible error detecting code uh, in this case. Um, so, there is something, so the first thing you can notice, and, and this sort of addresses your, your question, is, uh, you know, should you look at all functions? So is there certain equivalence among these functions uh, in that they give exactly the same value to this script F of S, uh, because that's the only thing which you're measuring. So if sigma is a permutation, uh, which you're going to think of permuting the coordinates, um, you can, it's an easy calculation to do that, that F of sigma of S, you know, exclusive word with A is the same as F of S, um, where, where the, you know, the, the circle plus is just mod two exclusive or. And so in that case, we'll say that S and sigma S plus A are isomorphic. And in fact, that map going from one to the other is, you know, an isomorphism. Uh, so in fact, um, that's one of the ways that if you have a good F, the way you find other Fs to try is you can make a random choice among what I'll call the Fs of sigma comma A. Uh, and those are the other, the other ones that you keep trying. And those uh, in practice turn out to be fairly close to independent. Uh, so, in fact, it's relatively easy at that point to, to you know, once you've analyzed S to figure out what the waiting time until you, you would succeed. Uh, so, the interesting point that comes up is that here I've only talked about the elements in one bucket. So, there's a question of can you fit them all together? So, if S is good in, in that we've actually maximize this function, we can define a hash function f from it uh, if it's a tile. So in other words, if you if a bunch of translates of this, meaning you translate by exclusive oring something, um, it essentially covers it as a disjoint union covers the whole space. So if that's the case, then each of the translates are, are the different buckets or, or actually the inverse image of the bucket. You know, are, are the different 
you know, buckets that, that fall in. So, um, and so basically the, um, what your hash, what your function is, once if you start with a, a set S, your hash function is actually just the index of the translate that, that you happen to be sitting in. Uh, now, one of the things I'm not talking about is the complexity of once you have an S, how you actually calculate S. That's, that's something I've swept under the rug. Uh, so here was the question I was asked. So, so to set the stage, I was sitting in my office minding my own business one day when one of my colleagues came in and posed this question to me. And he said, you know, some people have talked about using this and it seems to be conventional wisdom that you can't do any better than projection. In other words, just choose some set of R coordinates and then just look at those. And he said, can you investigate this? Now I thought about it and I thought this didn't seem completely plausible. Um, you know, so I said, if it were true, it had to be true for some trivial reason. But in fact, I, I thought about it for quite a while. Um, but the, it turns out that there is an answer. And the answer is it depends on the probability, P. Uh, and so here was the first, well, this wasn't actually the first thing I came up with, but it was uh, later. So this basis is based on something called the isoparametric uh, theorem for the hypercube, which was proved by Larry Harper, I did so a long time, probably 50 years ago, maybe more. Um, and basically, it uh, says if you have a subset of bit strings of length n, uh, you let little e of s be the number of x and s. In other words, you can think of the number of code words um, and y that are not in s. In other words, the, the code words that are distance one from x, which are not in s. So that's what's called the, the edge boundary of S. And Harper showed that the size of the edge boundary is always less than one half of the of absolute S, the number of elements in S times log base two of S. And equality happens if and only if S is what's called a subcube. In other words, what happens is if you just choose some number of coordinates and you you allow all and you you put zeros in all the other coordinates and you allow any elements in those and then you're allowed to actually then translate everything exclusive or everything by a constant vector. So basically, once yeah, you I have want the, to comment that sure. for the lower bound, it's uh, it's related to the recently solved sensitivity conjecture, I think. Yeah. Right. Yes. 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 It is. But there's the upper bound, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of other isoparametric th theorems, but this is the, uh, the one. So basically, this actually shows that, and this is maybe why people thought projection was best, because projection is best if the probability is small enough. And in, in particular, projection is best if the probability is less than, well, I, think I, um, I think I have a minus sign I left out is two to the minus two to the minus two times n minus r. Um, and of course, it might be better, as we'll see later, even at, at higher probabilities than that, but it definitely is better in that range. Uh, and basically, the proof is very simple because uh, is you actually look, if, if you go back to here and you look at this, polynomial f sub s of t, um, f sub s of t, uh, it turns out all, all of them have, for, for all the s's of the same size, they all have the same value of t equals zero. And so in particular, you're really interested in the first derivative at zero. So, uh, you know, of, of the difference between two successive ones, and basically the isoparametric theorem says that a1 of s is going to be n times absolute s minus e sub s. So that means that if you look at the theorem that the subcube 
has the largest A A1 sub S. So that immediately translates into the fact that it has a higher probability in that range. I mean, once you do that, it's a fairly simple uh, calculus exercise to, to get the bound that I get. Uh, so can I ask a question? Does the probability P depend on S? Uh, the probability, well, you mean, well, yeah, uh, yes, the, the probability, well, no, no, the probability P is, is something that's fixed by your problem. In other words, somebody tells you that this is the probability that, that you're going to garble the strings, which Got is, it. is a, and, and, and then once you choose P, you want to choose the best S. Thank you. You're welcome. And Victor? So, sure. Hi, um, Peter. I'm confused. Isn't, isn't, isn't isometric inequality normally a lower bound on the size of the boundary? Um, it's, this is, in this case, it's, um, this is the edge isoparametric inequality. I think. The, right. I so you're think saying that shouldn't, shouldn't the number of edges in the boundary be. It, oh, oh, maybe. Um, at least this. Not oh, a, maybe. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I have that, that backwards. I think, I think, I think you're probably right, Peter. I know it, the, yeah. Besides the inequality, but both sides are correct. Maybe the inequality system the symbol is wrong, <laughs> but um, but but yeah, let's yeah let's let's say uh, yeah you you really want you know the the coefficient a one sub s to be as large as possible. So I think you want e sub s to be as small as possible uh, for. For, for what you want. Yes, yes, so you're right. So, so it should be a lower bound. Um, so basically there's an old question. So can you do better than projection at all? And so one of the ways, one of the general ways which we found, so basically this is where um, I, I started and then uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Dan and Peter, uh, Dan Gordon and Peter Ostapenko got interested in this problem. And uh, basically we found that it's one of the answers that you can get, even though I had a specific answer earlier, um, was having to do with decoding linear codes. So to recall a, a subset of bits is a linear subspace uh, of dimension R is, is what I'll call a linear code. Uh, this is, you know, a linear subspace over the field of two elements. And uh, one of the ways of specifying a code is by giving its check matrix, which basically says that X is in the code if and only if uh, A times X is zero. Um, and what's known as the syndrome is that if I give you a garbled string that comes from the code, you can calculate A times X tilde. and if it hasn't been garbled, well, if x tilde is still in the code, then a x tilde will be zero. But if it isn't, then you'll get a certain non-zero value. And that specifies the coset C of the code, which contains x tilde. And so what syndrome decoding is about is for each coset, um, you choose an element of the coset of minimum Hamming weight which is called a coset leader. Some cosets actually have more than one, uh, but if it has more than one, just choose one of them. Um, and that actually is a way of decoding the code because that actually tells you uh, which element in, in the code is, is closest to that element. Uh, so basically, the whole idea is you use, you take a code and use a set of coset leaders as, as our set at S. And uh, it turns out one of the theorems that we proved was that asymptotically, if you fix the rate of the code, which is just the ratio of the dimension of the code to the ambient space, that as, uh, as the dimension goes to infinity, this will be projection for, uh, in other words, once you've, you've fixed P, uh, if you, you can make the dimension large enough at that rate, and this will always beat projection. 
And there's, there's in our paper, there's a certain quantification of, of how much it beats projection. But a, um, a particular illustration is uh, if you take the Golay code, which is a well-known perfect code, you can actually calculate what f of the Golay code is, um, and you get this polynomial. And it turns out that this will beat projection when the probability is greater than about 0.2555. You know, there's extra decimal points after that. Um, and below that, it actually loses out to projection. Um, so this actually motivates uh, what I'll call optimal regions. So if you take a set of bit strings, we'll say that S is optimal at a, uh, a value T between zero and one, if it actually, its value at T is bigger than any other F of S prime of T, which for S prime the same size as S. And so we'll say S is optimal if it's optimal at some T. So the real, goal that we have is can we find all or at least some optimal regions which are something that aren't projection um and so the basic theorem which we proved uh, is that an optimal subset is isomorphic you know we're using the isomorphism i gave before so the isomorphism again just means that you permute the coordinates and that you can actually XOR a fixed string onto all the coordinates. That's, that's the isomorphism. So we proved that an optimal subset is isomorphic to an order ideal uh, in a certain partial order on bit strings, which I'll describe below. And basically, the whole idea uses what's called shifting and compression functions of what's called the Erdős co rado from extremal set theory. Um, I first came across this, at least part of it, I was, I was looking over a paper by Dan Kleitman, and he was doing something, and I suddenly realized that it could have an application here, and I, sort of, I saw sort of half of this order, uh, and then uh, Dan and Peter sort of found the, the other half uh, in a paper by Andre Kunjan. So basically, the, whole, uh, the proof really looks at local failures in the order ideal and corrects them. So it turns out that if it fails in this order ideal, you can always find a pair of coordinates for which you can see the failure. And when you try to correct it, you show that if, you, if, if the correction doesn't give you a certain isomorphism, then it actually has to make the value of the function um, decrease. Uh, and so you do this piece by piece until you finally get to an order ideal. Um, so basically, I'll describe this. And you know, those of you, some of you know about this. But basically, I recall that if S is a set, then this inequality is a partial order if it, if it has all the, um, the normal things that you would expect in inequality, except that not every two elements m can be comparable that some just you can't compare at all. Otherwise, if elements are comparable, it's transitive, uh, it's anti-symmetric. In other words, if X is less than Y and Y is less than X, and X equals Y. Um, and in fact, X is less than or equal to X. So, uh, and such a, a thing with an order is called a poset. So basically, the easiest way to describe this order, at least I think, is you identify a bit string with just the subset of positions of the one bits. Uh, so there, so you identified a bit string with just some finite subset of the non-negative integers. And if you have such a set, you uh, t, if you look at t lower parenthesis i, uh, write that's the ith largest element of t. So this order is, so you say x is less than or equal to y if the if when you look at the ith elements, if i i x sub one is less than or equal to i y sub one and i x of k up to i y sub k. In other words, all the corresponding largest elements 
are, are less than or equal, where k is just the minimum size of the two sets. Uh, so if you think about this, you know, so normally subsets have a certain partial order just by containment. And this includes containment, but in, in containment order, two sets that are, have the same cardinality are not comparable, you know, unless they're equal. But in this case, this actually refines that. So this gives you a way of comparing two sets of the same cardinality, possibly. Um, so it turns out we, we worked on this order. And then later, actually, after we wrote our paper, I asked in Math Overflow if anybody had seen this order. And I got an answer from Dick Stanley, who said, yeah, I know this order. I studied this quite a lot. And in fact, it's the uh, subject of, of one of the chapters in his Enumerative Combinatorics, Volume 1, where it goes on, where, it's, where he was motivated by studying certain classes of partitions. Um, and he calls, so it seems to have many names. I've looked in the, in the literature. Uh, so we found a paper by Andre Kunjan, who had looked at a similar problem, where he called it a right-shifted partial order. Um, Stanley and I guess a student proctor and many others just call the poset M of N. Um, and uh, in other words, that's for you're dealing with N bit strings. And uh, Alzvede and Tom call it a pushing order. And uh, it turns out if you look at uh, Stanley and Proctor's papers, that this has a lot of interesting connections of partitions and coxeter groups. In fact, it turns out um, in retrospect, I maybe should have seen that this, if I had known about this, uh, because Stanley shows that the this is related to the coxeter group B sub n, uh, whose each coxeter group, which uh, has something called the vial group associated with it. And the vial group in this case is a group of sign permutations, which if you think about what my isomorphism is, each of those is essentially like a sign permutation where you have the permutation and the, and the uh, fixed thing you're going to add to it, mod two, it just gives the signs that you apply to the permuted elements. And it turns out once you have the sign permutation that Stanley has a paper which shows that basically this order sort of is intimately related to it. Uh, so uh, basically when you're dealing with partial orders, uh, there's one of the basic things which you call an order ideal, which is just basically a subset which, where if there's an element in the set, um, then any smaller element is also in the set. And the generators are just the maximal elements of the set, the set which is, is not smaller than any other element. And a principal ideal is one with only one generator. So it turned out that once we had this theorem, that this gave us, at least for small values of n minus r, this gave us the possibility of finding all of the optimal subsets. Uh, and basically, the, the plan is that you can find all order ideals of the size that you're looking for, and then you can calculate the corresponding function, you can compare them all and see if any of them is optimal at a certain point. Um, so basically, as part of the ingredients we needed for this is um, Squire gave a recursion which you can find all order ideals in a poset. But it turns out the number of all ideals in these posets grows much, much too quickly to make this practical at all. But it turns out, since we're only interested in those of limited size, you can modify Squire's recursion to sort of uh, essentially reject things as soon as we're getting too big. Um, and so it turns out the first ingredient you have to calculate is this sequence, which are the size of principal ideals of size n in this partial order capital M sub n. And you get the sequence, which um, I'll, I'll tell Neil isn't yet in the OEIS. It turns out it's not there. Uh, I am going to add it soon. Uh, so I'll, I'll do my duty. Um, and it turns out once you have that, you can write a program, 
um, which using this set of principal ideals actually goes through Squire's recursion uh, and calculates uh, order ideals in the set M sub N. And that's actually uh, sequence A274312 in OEIS. And this grows, I mean, I, I, I fit this by, by least squares on the log scale. It looks like about around this 2.06 something times one and a quarter to the N. It's, it seems to be growing exponentially. I mean, I'd like to be able to prove this. It should be possible, but I haven't yet. Um, the things I put in boxes are the ones where N is a power of two, because these are the ones we're really interested in. Um, and so it turns out we were able to actually calculate all of these order ideals all the way up to N equals 32, which is the last thing I put in a box. But you see that that's already about 4.3 million. And so N equals 64, which is the next is sort of out of the question. Um, so, but we did go up to the ones of order 32. And what we did is we find all small optimal regions. Um, so we calculated the column corresponding F sub S and we compared all of them to find the optimal regions. Um, and it turns out, here's what we found. For S is two, four, and eight, the only projection is optimal. Uh, for S is 16, there were five optimal besides projection. And 32, there were 20 optimal. And 64, there were 56 optimal. Now, it turned out that we were looking in the symbolic algebra system MAGMA. And MAGMA has a, a handy list of best linear codes for various sizes, along with their, their coset leaders for syndrome decoding. And we looked at this set. And it turned out. Interestingly enough, for all but 10 of the things of size 64, it turned out that these regions were sets of minimal weight coset leaders of a certain linear code. So uh, at first we thought, well, maybe their tables didn't get go far enough and that the other 10 were that too, uh, but we didn't know. Uh, so, so if we were foolhardy, we'd say, well, they all would be. We just haven't found it yet. Uh, so here were what I call the terrible 10. So I had this list. Uh, these are given by the generators. And I had this list sitting around in my office. And every once in a while, I would look at it. And I would say, God, you know, I, there must be some way of finding the linear code. And I just could not find a way. I started writing uh, a bunch of programs. And they just sort of got nowhere. So finally, um, I, uh, so basically what the, the thing I was looking for was that if it's a linear code, um, well, well, first of all, I'll talk about what a tile is. So a subset is a tile I mentioned before, if you can cover all of the bit strings of length and by disjoint translates of it. Um, and so basically the set of elements which tell you how to translate the individual pieces is called a complement of S. And notice this is actually symmetric between A and S. So A is also a tile. Um, and this last equation is actually important later on. So it turns out the uniqueness is equivalent to the fact, it's, it's not hard to see that if you add A to itself, and you add S to itself, and you look at all the elements which you get, then their intersection has to be zero. Now, in fact, in our case, we know what S is and we're looking for A, where we hope to find A. Um, but there's a real question. So the question is, how can you decide if a subset is a tile? So since I had been doing things with integer programming, I decided, well, why don't I try integer programming on this? So it turns out that integer programming, um, it turns out it's easy to pose this as an integer programming problem, though there are, I'll, I'll talk about different ways of doing it. So it turns out we need to talk about characteristic functions of sets. So basically, the characteristic function of a set is basically just one if x is in the set and 0 otherwise. And we have what's called convolution over uh, the bit strings. 
is just this following sum, a sum over y of gx times h of x plus y. And so remember, s is unknown and a, s is known and a is unknown. So it turns out that it's fairly easy to see when you have convolution that if you look at chi a convolve with chi s at x, that that's just the number of pairs a comma s which sum up to x. Uh, so, and in one of the nice ways of dealing with convolution is the Hadamard transform, which is this formula. And it's one of the fundamental things. It's an, it's a cute exercise to show that it turns convolution into product. And so that actually makes things a lot nicer. So it turns out that the, um, that the condition for um, a is that chi hat of A, which you can consider unknown, times chi hat of S, which is known, is equal to absolute A times what I call delta of Y. So where delta of Y is just a delta function. Delta of Y is one if Y is zero and zero otherwise. So if you look at it that way, um, these are just linear equations because chi hat of S is just some linear combination of the, of the elements of, well, I mean, chi hat of A is just some linear combination of the, of, of, of the values of the, the characteristic function. So basically what an integer program is, is you give a finite set of linear inequalities and equalities with integer variables, and it supposed, finds the value of the variable satisfying all of them. Uh, integer programming in general wants to find optimize a certain function, but here we're only dealing with something called feasibility, whether or not it has a solution at all. Um, so it turns out here's what the integer program looks like. You have variables for both the um, both what's called the primal and the dual side, variables on describing the set S and variables describing the, the Hadamard transform of the characteristic function. And so here are the, uh, the actual conditions. So uh, it turns out um, if you drop the condition, those first two conditions where it says that those elements have to be integers, then you get what's called a linear program. Now, a linear program, it turns out that's sort of the bread and butter of these solvers. Linear programs can be solved fairly quickly. Uh, so the whole idea, and, it, but, uh, and so one of the strategies is, is you look at what's called the relaxation, that is you drop the integers, and you look at the solution, and you hope that somehow this shows you something about the solution in integers. Uh, but I gave this to CPLEX, which is sort of this heavy duty commercial solver, and basically it really got nowhere. I let it run for a long time on let's say one of them and it just didn't report anything. Um, so it turns out that I then looked at that other condition, which I had. Um, so I then was able to uh, leverage that, which you'll see in the next slide to a slightly different integer program. Uh, and it turned out I was able to give that to CPLEX and much to my surprise, it showed that the examples in dimensions 12, 13, 14, and 15 showed that it wasn't a tile, that A did not exist. And in fact, it turned out as being an integer program wasn't even necessary. Uh, but here is the program. Uh, so it turns out that um, since we're, that the variables are now the convolution of the, of the characteristic function with itself. And then it's Fourier transform, which it turns out is just the absolute value of the Fourier transform squared. Um, and so you get the following program. And again, um, there's two conditions in the beginning where if something is an integer and there's a more complicated condition where it's a square of an integer, but let's say I'll just drop those conditions. And it turns out in the cases which I gave, 
that CPLEX showed that as a linear program, it was infeasible. That is, there was no solution to those inequalities at all. So this sort of surprised me uh, because normally this kind of relaxation, uh, you're usually not that lucky in finding that. Uh, and in fact, I found uh, another uh, paper which concerned itself with binary tiles where they gave other criteria for non-tileability, which in fact I had earlier used, but they didn't apply to my cases. And in all cases, the linear program infeasibility showed uh, all their examples were, were non-tileable, non-tiles. Um, but it turns out you have to be a little careful when you pose this to CPLEX, because if you write down the Hadamard transform as it's defined, it turns out the matrix that you get involves two to the two n non-zero coefficients. And even, and that starts getting pretty big. I mean, even for n equals 12, I mean, that's about over, you know, almost 17 million coefficients. Uh, and it gets much worse. So it turns out that one way of cutting, of making this a lot easier is by using what's called the fast Hadamard transform. Um, but in general, there's an idea of what's called sparse matrix multiplication. So if you have a matrix A and you want to calculate A times X, it turns out you can do this in the number of multiplies, which are essentially only the number of non-zero elements in A. And so it turns out the strategy, suppose that you were lucky with your matrix and you could write it as a product of a small number of sparse matrices. So at that point, you win because, um, and in fact, the fast Hadamard transform, it turns out is exactly, has exactly that property that you can write down um, the matrix of the Hadamard transform as a product of N matrices where the number of non-zeros in each of those is only two to the N. So in fact, instead of taking two times two to the N multiplies, it only takes uh, N times two to the N, which is much smaller. Um, now it turns out in order to do this linear programming, uh, what you do is you just introduce extra variables for the intermediate, the values of the intermediate products. Uh, but this altogether is a great win. It makes the problem much smaller. And that was the only thing that made the one feasible up to, to, uh, to N equals 15. Um, and in fact, um, so what happened is that this actually solved it pretty quickly. So I was pretty happy with myself and I gave a talk about this at work. And uh, you know, I, I gave the, the list of the terrible 10 on the board and left it there. And in the middle of the talk, Don Coppersmith piped up and said, oh, I can prove the one for n equals 16 isn't feasible. And I said, really, how did you do that? So it turned out we got together and there was another method which I'm about to describe and we were able to apply it uh, to, to finish off all 10. Uh, so the whole idea is this is a completely different method using combinatorics. So the whole idea is, suppose I choose some convenient linear subspace of Bn. Uh, if I intersect the X set S with all the cosets of S, it sort of chops up the, the, the parts of S into different pieces. In other words, the pieces are the parts of S that lie in the different cosets. And it turns out, if you look at this equation of A plus S intersected with B plus X, then that that's the same as S intersected of A plus B plus X. Now, what does that mean? It means that, um, that if you translate S by anything, that the set of pieces that are intersected with the cosets of S re remains the same in terms of their cardinalities. So it turns out that for each of these, um, each of these examples that I gave, you can do this. And you can look at the piece census of S. And if, if you multiply all those out, you see they all total up to 64. And so for example, the one with, uh, with size of uh, with size 17 has three pieces of size two and 18 pieces of size three, and one piece of size four. And when you analyze it, you find out 
that you have to use every single piece in order to cover all the cosets of X. Actually, so you actually duplicate the pieces, you know, to correspond to all the translates. So it turns out by just very simple uh, observation, you can show that these can't be put together. So for example, um, your, the, the size of the bin is actually the size of X. So if X is a linear subspace with only four vectors in it, let's say look at 21, um, it turns out that uh, you, if, if you've used a, a piece of size two, then the only pieces you have left are pieces of size three and four. So there's no way that you can actually make up a, a, a thing of size four. So that shows for that line 21 that you that can't possibly um, that can't possibly have a tile. And you can go through um, you can go through all of these, except that um, it turns out that if you look at um, at eight and at at the first two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So so these are the ones that we were able to make work. And it turns out, strangely enough, that we could not find, I mean, it might, might exist, but we couldn't find a, a set X, a linear subspace X, so that it worked with the two smallest cases. But now, in fact, we actually had independent proofs with, with two completely different techniques of four of them, the ones for K equals eight, nine, 16, and 17, um, that they weren't tiles. So, um, so basically, um, what does this lead to do? Well, there's a lot to do. Well, first of all, it would be nice to prove asymptotics of the number of order ideals uh, in MN, which I gave. Um, and it would be better to characterize those ideals using the optimal regions, because right now we had like over 4 million in the case of n equals 32, which we had to compare with one another we each computed this polynomial, and then we had to compare, look, look at the differences of each two polynomials and look to find what their roots were. Uh, and this was pretty tedious. Uh, so it would be nice if you could somehow figure out another character characterization which could rule out some of them a priori. Um, and I guess maybe I'm optimistic since after finding out about this partial order and all the results that, that Stanley and Proctor, et cetera, have about it, makes me wonder if there's some, some of their information which they have, which we can use for that. Um, then there's also- Sorry, sorry better... Victor, to interrupt. We have minus five minutes left. So oh, my... another minus oh. one minute. Okay, well, this is just the end, okay. So then there's a question of when does bin packing work and can we combine the two ideas? And so the ultimate goal is a good characterization, those ideals yielding tiles, okay. I thought I thought I thought this was um, two, 52. So here's here's a few references. There are a lot more which are related to this. You can see the two papers which we have are the ones um, here. Uh, this was the the later. Well, the first one was this one which we published in IEEE IT, and then this is the one that Don and I published, which gave the two criteria I just described for non titleability And here, um, so Kunjin was a paper that solved, well, looked at a fairly related problem. So he used the same partial order uh, that we did. Um, and anyway, that's, that's basically it. So if there are any other questions, uh, feel free. This ends, this, this ends the official part of this talk because it went uh, way over time. But uh, so Robert, please stop recording. But people are welcome to informally stay and hang out with Victor.